Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski. I'm joined by my co-host, Yoni Mazur. And today's guest is an e-commerce and Amazon consultant, Jordi Ordonez. Jordi, how are you? Great. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank, thank you to, for inviting me. Sorry. Oh, of course. Thank you so much for coming on. We're so excited to finally make this happen. We had a couple of scheduling yeah conflicts and rearrangement. So very excited to have this conversation with you today. And we will talk about how you help Amazon sellers and your consulting work closer to the middle of the episode. We'll get there. But mm -hmm. right now, we want to learn all about you, Jordi. So starting from the beginning, just tell us about yourself. Starting from the beginning, that was 43 years ago, but I don't want to go that back. Um, <laughs> I'm an e-commerce and Amazon consultant. I'm based in Barcelona, Spain. I've been living here my whole life, which is 43 years. I have two kids and a dog. And of course, my wife, Laia, she works with me. Um, she's a content manager. She's, well, she's a copywriter. And mostly we work together for... Um, e-commerce clients based in Spain, selling all over Europe and Amazon clients as well. And my background is in SEO and web development. Well, it's, well I was developing websites for five or six years until, until I realized it wasn't my thing. Mm. So I moved to e-commerce and started my own um, e-commerce website, e-commerce shop. My first shop was um, uh, a music store. I was selling um, reggae and ska music and reggae and ska merchandising because I was playing in reggae bands. <laughs> nice. That was, that was 13 or 14 years ago. Um, and then I started working with clients, mostly first developing um, e-commerce websites using PrestaShop. And then I moved to consultancy. But let's take it back even further. You had mentioned that you had an SEO business and you did some web design, but you became very interested in computers at an early age, around eight or so. And you had accidentally wiped your dad's hard drive. What were you trying to do? I did. I, did. I learned about this trick um, on a newspaper, well, on a specialized computer uh, magazine. And it turns out it was a joke. Um, it was something like, if you want uh, to free your space on your hard drive, just uh, input format C on your computer. And I tried that. And it turns out I wiped my parents, well, my father hard drive, mm -hmm. which was full of work. And yeah. What does he do? Was... Is he a lawyer? Is he an accountant? Is no, he... no. Engineer? He's a doctor. Oh, oh no. no. Yeah. <gasps> and I think he didn't have a backup because you, you didn't have the external hard, hard drives. Um, so he didn't have a backup. So yeah, he was pretty angry. But that was my first you know, <laughs> moment of truth when it comes to computers. You know, like if you input the incorrect information on this thing, you can mess up things. Yes. Was he able to recover any of it? No. Oh, no. Not a single <laughs> bite of information. Oh, that's tragic. That's so I, unfortunate. That's that's like almost worse than coming into class and being like, my dog ate my homework. It's like, <laughs> my kid, hang on, I'm not lying. My kid wiped my hard drive. <laughs> yeah, but I was eight years old, I think. So there was an excuse. Like, yeah, yeah. my kid is a ball. Oh. He was just messing around with my computer and accidentally um, wiped all the data. Oh, I'm so rich. Yeah. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. And so then you got into playing in a band and I know you're quite a, a heavy metal fan. So talk yep. to us about the impact that music has had on your life. Obviously you had a business in it for some time. So mm -hmm. walk us through that. Hold on, but I see a little bit of a gap between heavy metal and to reggae later on. So yeah. Yeah, but well, you know, I like really extreme style so it has to be really fast or really slow mm. so <laughs> what i love to play when i begin when i begin playing uh, guitar i was well actually i began playing uh piano years ago and i was playing classic stuff like well 
Mozart and Chopin <laughs> and then Beatles. And then I discovered this guy playing on TV. He was a slash Guns N' Roses guitar oh, player. Oh, yeah, big time, yeah. And I was like, I want to be this guy. Well, <laughs> what was it, November Rain? Was it uh, Knocking on Seven? No. What was that first song that got you? Actually, it was Mr. It's Brownstone. Up. Mr. Brownstone. Nice. It's, nice. Uh, yeah, it's a, a song on Appetite for Destruction. Mr. Brownstone, yeah. I know. That one, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I want to be this guy. So I started. Did you have, did you have the curly hair also? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I. Um, I started playing guitar, you know, I mess around with a, a guitar, an old guitar I had at my parents. And, and then I moved to electric guitar because, well, I learned about distortion and um, martial arts and, and that was, well, I really like that, you know, aggressive sound. And then I started listening to ACDC, Metallica, Megadeth, Sepultura and all that stuff, thrash metal mostly. And then God knows how, I ended on playing in a reggae band <laughs> because some friends were playing there. And I thought, yeah, this is easy because I'm used to playing Master of Puppets, you know, at fast beat. And this is really, really slow. So I appreciated that kind of music more okay. relaxed. And you I'm... consume the fast beat, but then you kind of unwind with this reggae. So I think it's a therapeutic in a good way. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's like being a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde playing a guitar. <laughs> so I stick to that for 14 years, playing in bands, you know, big venues, small venues. And that was... That, really you're fun. making a living out there or mostly no, for your pleasure no. and soul? I was getting free beers. And believe me, when you're <laughs> in your 20s, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. True. Okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's almost like an income. That's where the money was going anyway, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so what were you doing then for kind of your first job? And when did you start working? So you're playing music, you are, you know, playing with computers, but how did you start to make money? My first job was um, actually developing websites on a small agency. And, and then I started freelancing for some of my friends. Um, I think that my first website was the one from my band, and the second one was for a record label, a okay. SCA record label based in Ma in Madrid. And my first website, I developed it um, using FromPage, which was Windows framework for creating websites, and using Microsoft Word, believe it or not, you could <clears throat> um, like code and HTML coding on uh, Microsoft Word. Oh, wow. So, and yeah, one of my first websites actually was using GeoCities. This is like from 20 years ago. I don't What's know. that? What's that? GeoCity? GeoCities.com. It was a free hosting for websites. Mm -hmm. Really, really back in the day. I mean, not even Amazon started back then. <laughs> so <I'm, laughs> I think that was in 1998, 1999. But it seems like the music brought you into this digital uh, internet uh domain because you wanted to create the websites for you know for music purposes and stuff like that so it's pretty interesting the connection yeah kind of yeah 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 and what did you do after like graduation you had your first job did you pursue uh higher education at a university no not really i was working in this small agency and i was doing 600 euros a month which was a lot of money for me because i was living at my parents mm -hmm. so i spent it in guitars because remember i had three beers so i could spend it on pedals distortion pedals amplificators and guitars which was great you know when, when you're in your 20s that's the greatest way to spend money you yeah. stick to guitar and you stay away with from drugs you know yeah. so <laughs> if you spend all your money in guitars you don't have any more money to you know living a bad life or spending it on unless you become a rock star no, 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 no. That wasn't really my thing. I mean, if you play reggae music, you can become a rock star. True. Then you'd be a oh. reggae star, not a rock star. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so instead of cocaine, it goes to weed and something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't smoking at all. Okay, good, good. And, Smart choice. And and I know that your love for music extends just beyond uh, your 
your your work and everything and and you really love media and different types of you know you love the wire and things so just kind of talk to us about your family and the influence that entertainment and media has had on your life well it was mostly my wife which introduced me to um tv series and we were watching back in the day you know like Breaking Bad, uh, Walking Dead, Sopranos, uh, The Wire, and actually my dog is named after um, uh, the Wire character. Um, Which one? Duquan. Duquan, huh? Duquan Duki. I think it's in the fourth season. And my son is named after Luke Skywalker. Well, I have two sons. One is Joel. He has a normal name. And the other one is Luke. Um, the small one. He has, he's five years old. You call him just Luke, but not Luke Skywalker or Daniel. No, 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 no. It's Luke or Tony. Yeah. Okay, it would good. be great. Luke, Luke Skywalker, <laughs> Skywalker or Tony. You know, like <laughs> I first tried to name my first son Dexter because I love Dexter. But my wife was like, no, we are not naming him. How I actually met the actor. And, uh, yeah, I was walking with Central Park once and I saw him just walking there. The, the actor Dexter. I'm like, oh, Dexter, what's up? <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Yeah. He's a great guy. He well, and, and Six Feet Under is great as well. I mean, he's known for Dexter, but Six Feet Under was a great. I actually great liked his work. Uh, he didn't act there. He just he was a narrator of uh, a, a um, documentary about the Vietnam War. Really, I think it was yeah. He is. I mean, very powerful documentary. I think it's from Ken Burns. Is a producer. He's a big documentary mm -hmm. kind of guy. But he did the narr. Uh, he was basically doing, he was a narrator, so he's taking the whole story, so his voice, and it was really Im impactful for me. So I like that line of work that he did, and that most people are not even aware of. Yeah, I forgot the I name of this actor, that. but uh, the Dexter guy. Yeah, yeah, the Dexter guy. Yeah, the serial killer, <laughs> the friendly serial killer. Friendly serial killer. Yeah. So yeah, most of my childhood, um, I spent it watching Star Wars movies because of my father. Um, he took me to the movies, and I first watched The Empire Strike. Empire Strikes Back, mm -hmm. and it was a uh, it blew my mind. You know the androids, the ships, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker. I mean, that was great. <laughs> and so, when in all of this did Amazon come into play? That was in 2015 because I had uh, another website. Um, I was selling um, guitar strings. Mm -hmm. And I heard about um, Amazon, which was kind of new in Spain. They started operation in Spain in 2014. So in January 2015, I started selling on Amazon. I listed my first listing in, in January 26, and I got my first order 24 hours later. Oh, wow. And this was for yeah. the guitar strings business, but you had already been selling them on your own site. So how were you sourcing the product at that time? Was it your own brand or you were just reselling? No, no, I was reselling uh, Daterio, Tim Markley, and Ernie Ball strings. Which, oh, so there's uh, both well, in demand, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was sourcing them from a um, small shop, a small distributor, which was three streets away from my flat. Mm, okay. So it was a nice, easy, easy commute, lightweight, small product, <laughs> pretty ideal. Yeah, absolutely. But there was no FBA at the time. I think FBA started one year later around 2016. So it was all FBA for, FBM for me. And so you were fulfilling fulfill orders merchant. out mm -hmm. of your flat? Yeah. I was fulfilling all the stuff from my flat. Yeah, but the good thing had... about guitar strings are very small. It's like, you know, it's like... Yeah, but I was also selling guitars. So I had guitars Ooh. and distortion pedals, well, effects pedals on my flat. So, yeah, my wife was pretty pissed. That's a cool <laughs> flat to have, uh, a flat apartment to have with full of guitar. I like that. It's pretty cool. If you're single, but if you're married, <laughs> ah, it's not right. the same. It's not the mm -hmm. same. Unless yeah, she's yeah, the lead she... singer and she has a good voice, you can just... No, no, jam, she wasn't happy about down. it. She yeah, wasn't yeah. happy about it. No, because those guitars take up a lot of real estate and you have to have a lot of protective packaging for them. So did you list everything that you had on your own site on Amazon or did you just start with the strings? I started with the strings and then guitars. Mostly of the guitars, I was drop shipping them, but some of them I had to stock. Uh, so yeah, my wife wasn't really happy about it. So How do you I even had... ship that? I'll be so afraid to ship that. You know, <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, damages, some, yeah. sometimes you just cross fingers and hope for the best. Me, guitar is holy. I have a few. Um, I share a lot of the same background. Funny enough, I was in a band doing rock, doing playing Slash. 
and I got my classic, my acoustic, my electric. And for me, just even when I carry it, it's like it's like holy thing. It's like it's you can't drop it, you can't. So I don't know to ship it. Whoa. Yeah, um, you never know. You never know. But I was shipping from Barcelona to mostly Barcelona. I mean, same city, ah, or okay. maybe Madrid, which which well, I mean, things can happen. So you're not uh, shipping it to Germany or Poland or no, 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 no. No, thank you. I gotcha. Okay. No, no, no. And so how long did you run that brand for, or are you still running the brand? Uh, actually, that website, I was running the shop for one year and a half, I think. And then I transformed the website into an affiliate website. And I was selling all kinds of stuff, um, guitar related, like guitars, pedals, amplificators, you know, straps, strings. And I was selling Thoman, Thoman, which is a German website um the biggest um european website when it comes to music mostly guitars and basses and i was using uh their affiliate program and i sold yeah quite a, a lot of guitars using the the affiliate program but so they were change your model that. yeah you change your model instead of owning it you because you if you realize that you can uh, master the the traffic and, you know, and, and the demand for that and you know uh repurpose it to uh, the source and the source yep. can deal with all the rest kind of things. So uh, less static for you and just cleaner income. Absolutely. And less problems and less headaches. Because, well, as you said, you never know when you're shipping a guitar if it will be broken or um, whatever. You know, things can happen. So Even if you have insurance, you got to deal with insurance. That's time, that's headache, aggravation. Yeah, but the insurance is pretty expensive in Spain. So it's really not worth it because it's against oh. your margin. You normally pay for the assurance yourself. I mean, the client is not paying for the assurance. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, well, numbers were not great. Well, what's, so. the, what's the typical price point for all these guitars that you sold that you, uh, when you actually sold yourself and not just redirected to uh, the other mm -hmm. guy? Like 100 mm -hmm. euros, 1,000 euros? No, between 600 euros and three, 4,000. Because uh, oh, I sold whoa. some Gibson, Gibson, Fenders. Gibson US, um, some some of them, like Gibson Les Pauls and Gibson SGs. And I think I also sold a PRS, a Paul Reed Smith, which is uh, three, four thousand euros. So it's yeah, quite yeah. expensive. He says the Gibson US because it's uh, bringing me back to my childhood. Gibson has like three kind of manufacturing lines, I think. It has uh, the US, which is the most expensive and most premium. I think it's yeah. a Mexican. Yeah. And what was that one? Chinese? The, the other ones in uh, Japan. Chinese? Maybe? Japan? Yeah. Yeah, Japan. Asia somewhere, yeah. So based on that, you you know pay the premium. Though. So the Asia is the most affordable, and then mm -hmm. Mexican is a bit in the middle. And then Gibson US means like made in America. You, you got the... Yeah, That's the like Fender. Price. You have the uh, Japanese Fenders, uh, the Mexican ones, and then the US, which is like the Ferrari for uh, the Fenders. Yeah, so both companies in a way created the same kind of uh, world. The Fender and Gibson, they always have this traditional guitar war. There's actually a podcast called um, uh, Business Wars. It's called Business War, and they have a special uh, session and episodes on guitar. Ver I mean, guitar uh, Gibson versus Fender. So you should check that out, uh, Jordi. You'll, you'll appreciate right. it. You have also like uh, Dunkin' Donuts versus uh, Starbucks and all these like they take nemesis and kind of show you how over the years they they you know they made their moves. It's pretty cool. It's called Business oh, Wars. Business Wars. Okay, yeah. we'll have to to tag that in the description of this episode. That's very cool. I well we'll get we'll get to the question at the end about books and and podcasts, but that's super <clears> cool. <throat> it's by Wondery. Oh yeah, Nike versus or Netflix versus HBO. Nike versus Adidas. Huh. Yeah, it's really cool. cool. Really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so Jordi, tell us more about what it is that you're doing now and with your consultancy and who it is that you're helping, how you're operating, et cetera. I'm mostly helping Amazon sellers, uh, Spanish based Amazon sellers, and I'm helping them to improve sales in Spain and the rest of Europe. And then I have a, another set of clients, which I work the SEO for their e-commerce websites because my background is in SEO. So, and, and then I have my own projects, like affiliate websites. Gotcha. And I'm okay. promoting, yeah, mostly um, Amazon-related tools. Mostly Amazon tools. Yeah, like and software so agencies. Yours. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. like a directory. Uh, it's a famous directory for the industry, actually. So even though it's originated in Spain, I think in the industry, it, it, it has a pretty nice position because you also have it in English, not just Spanish, right? Yeah. I mean, well, mostly of my content is in English because the U.S. is the biggest market. <clears throat> and 
if you want to live out of affiliation in Spain, um, reselling software, it's kind of, I mean, I've tried that, but pff, the numbers are not great. So you have to focus on the US and UK. Yeah, you go to the largest markets India. in the world. Yeah. So it's digital uh, native. So yeah. why not? You don't have to make extra uh, legwork. And yeah, so he has a nice directory, uh, lots of tools and services uh, from all across the rainbow of the e-commerce. And well done, Jordi. Uh, pretty impressive how you did it. I have reviewed more than 400 so far. Wow. Because that, that... started 10, 10 years ago. Yeah, when my son was one year old. So which one, Luke? No, the other one, Joel. Joel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is impressive. And so for the Amazon sellers that you're helping with looking to expand, are these sellers that should be launching their very first product or already have a product and need to know how to get to the next level? Kind of where is your specialty with helping your clientele? I mostly specialize in uh, brands, um, established brands, because you know, launching the first product, it's can be really tricky if you don't know how Amazon works. And I'm not that kind of consultant. You know, you have uh, mentorships and courses and YouTube videos about it. And it's not my speciality. I help big brands. Big brands. All right. So, and if folks are interested in working with you or learning more, checking out the directory, where can they find you? Uh, it's under jordiob.com slash Amazon tools slash Amazon tools. Okay. Slash. Uh -huh, yeah. I love slash. Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah, you got the snake pit. Guy. I don't know if you follow the snake pit, uh, you know, life. You do that as well? Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So again, listeners, that is jordyob.com and you can email Jordy directly at jordy, J-O-R-D-I-O-B at gmail.com. Um, Jordy, where does the B come from? Your name's Jordi Ordonez. Where's the B? Well, actually, we have two surnames in oh. uh, in Spain. So it's my mother's surname. It's Burgues. Gotcha. Okay. I've been wondering You could translate it. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but you could translate it for bourgeois. Ah. Yeah, like bourgeois meaning, um, how do you say that? Bourgeois in English. It's uh, well, I know it's in English, slang, but what does it mean? Yeah, what it means. The slang is bougie. It's short for the yeah. like the bourgeois, the, affl the affluent, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it's like high, uh, high, high society, class. high society high of society. cities. You know, yeah, and, and affluent. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, but I'm not coming from the high society. I can tell you that because well, <laughs> if I was coming from high society, I won't be doing a podcast at 4 p.m. Ah, <laughs> uh, but it, it sounds like you—you you know, your father's a doctor. It seems like you know, yeah, it's a, you're middle class. I would say, you know, like... yeah, but but it's a doctor in Spain. It's not the same as being a doctor in the U.S. Actually, mm. he was he was offered a job in a Mayo's clinic in uh, oh. Rochester, and believe me, the the paycheck was. Pff, I mean, you can add two zeros. Wow. Because wow. in the U.S., it's, so it's not ten x; it's a hundred x, basically, hundred yeah. times more. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, but he refused the um, the job position because he wanted to help us with the grandsons. Oh, that's very sweet. Very family oriented. I mean, and at the end of the day, he lives in Barcelona and we have a nice beach and sunny weather and Rochester. I mean, it's living in the Ice Age. <laughs> it's only 30 minutes on one hand, uh, which is, you know, a world class city, but I agree. I love Barcelona more than New York. No offense to anybody. I was just there yeah, for the no first time last year. It's just I love. It's a very. I'm. I'm. You know. I'm from Israel, so it reminds me of Tel Aviv very much. Uh, I just love the Mediterranean. It just. It's a different tempo, lifestyle, uh, and feeling, and it's really good feeling. Yeah. So. And I'm really you sorry. Can't, um, you can't buy things with money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rochester folks, but I've seen the pictures and believe me, that's I age. <laughs> yeah. It's just, New York weather, but yeah, it's well behind me. Yeah. It, yeah. But even just the speed of life and in general, the speed at which people move in New York versus Barcelona. I mean, I think your your dad would need a doctor for the heart palpitations. It's like so yeah. stressful up there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely.
Awesome. Well, Jordy, we are going to transition into the second part of the show now, answering seven questions around entrepreneurship. And Mm -hmm. the first question we ask every guest, because I think this is so important because Amazon is such a stressful environment to be in, although it offers incredible opportunity, there's a lot going on. So as a seller yourself, as a parent, as a spouse, as an entrepreneur, how are you managing your stress? Well, I don't have much stress. <laughs> that's that's plays reggae. One. Come on, that's it. <laughs> yeah. it's, pretty, it's pretty out there. No, actually, when I work, I um, I'm listening to heavy metal mostly all the time. So yeah, it's really stressful. But I don't have much stress because um, for me, it's a balance because um, between work and personal life. So I'm trying to work um, four to six hours a day, and so yeah, I try not to get involved with toxic clients or projects that I don't want to work in. Because... You're selective. You select your earliness, but you, you you'll be more selective. You have a good balance. Interesting way of doing it. Wow. Yeah, because I've been there for years. I used to work for a big agency, like 14, 16 hours a day. And I, I almost had a heart attack when I was 25 years old at 4 a.m. I was wow. so stressed, you know. And well, stress, work, coffee, relationships, whatever, you know, but I was only five years old and I just realized that wasn't for me. You know, if you want to have a family, a life, you can live that way. So for me, it's kind of a balance between having a personal life, work and and training every day. So I walk, wake up around 6 a.m. every day. I walk the dog, drink two coffees at the bar say some jokes to the apartment, you know, like, yeah, no big deal. Then I drive my kids to school. I go to the gym for one hour and then I start working around 10 a.m., 9, 10 a.m. And I work for hours and then I mostly I take a nap every day, which is something. Siesta, really, baby. Siesta, baby. That's really Spanish. That's really Spanish. And I, I sleep for one hour and then I answer some emails at night pick my kids from school and go into the park to play with him. And that's it. Actually. Any American person listening to this are like, what did he just say? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, is that life? That life can be like that? that is, yeah, it's, it's a it's literal a dream. Game. That is, that is. And Even that in is... retirement, they're like, are you in retirement? I'll you know, be that relaxed, you know? Yeah. It took me, it took me a lot of work and lots of years, you know, but well done, mostly well I, I live, um, 50% of my income is coming from my um, my own projects. So that's really easy to manage your day by day. You know, I don't have any meetings with myself or I don't have to work eight hours straight in a day for myself. So, yeah, it took me 14 years. But I am living not the dream now because the dream what for me was would be not working at all and traveling all day. But, yeah kind of living how oh, it's good to stay dream. productive i think that's it's, it's helpful you need to stay productive i feel like you're moving things around that, that you know and i love my work i mean i love to work four to six hours a day but that's it yeah very cool <laughs> i love that beautiful balance you have and mm-hmm. so next question is what books or even podcasts i'm learning a lot of our entrepreneurs love the podcasting now uh, what books or podcasts do you recommend every entrepreneur read or subscribe to uh podcast actually i listen to spanish podcasts um and it's called capital with a k um it's about economics and lifestyle and when it comes to english podcasts um have you heard about these guys tom and alex the honest fba yes honest fba yes Mm -hmm. yeah I listen to to the podcast as well and books yeah i've read a lot of books and well i had to wrote some of them down because um because i had too many to recommend so <laughs> i would recommend the lean startup yep. um then there was this eye opener for me um when it comes to accounting and financing um it's called profit first mm-hmm. i don't know if you read it um and then coming from to the Amazon side of the of the books, I love to read um, "Poorly Made in China." That's that's a great one and really mm-hmm. funny. It's about a middleman um, between um, 
um, American manufacturers and the Chinese factories and mm -hmm. everything in between. Um, then there's uh, this other one called China, China's Disruptors, um, which is about Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei. And then the China Paradox. Um, I love China. Yeah. <laughs> and this one explores contradictions within um, China's growth model and the global economy and the communists. Um, and then two Amazon related books, the Amazon Marketplace Dilemma, um, which is from an agency, a US agency called the Buy Box Ex Experts. Yeah, James Thompson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. It's, a, it's about um, how can you manage your brand on the Amazon vendor era. Mm -hmm. and, and the last one, it's Amazon Unbound. It's from well, Bradstone. I don't know if you read the Everything Store. It's another book by this guy, Brad Stone, and he has inside information um, from Amazon workers and ex-workers. And it has a lot of gossip and, you know, funny stories about the Amazon, the Amazon growth, growth. The Amazon uh, experience. But well, one small question on, or big question on China. You said you like China. So all the, all the, all the information you understand about China, what do you think looking to the future quickly? Are they going to become the empire or America will be? Uh, so they, the the I'm sorry, but they will absolutely dominate us. I mean, when it comes to technology and and e-commerce, they will be the leaders. That's, I mean, no doubt about it. But, okay, e-commerce, but what about just economy, politics, uh, world leadership? Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm not an expert in economics or politics, and I don't like to talk about things that are not my expertise, So, and, which is... Um, something you can find in the uh, majority of the Spanish people <laughs> because everyone likes to opinion, talk about opinion. everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, everyone has an opinion, but I've read a lot of books and I've seen lots of information, but I don't have a, you know, a forged opinion and I don't consider myself an expert. So I, yeah, I think the connection is economics. So typically the empires, if they do want well economics, they be, then that gives them the political and world leadership kind of um, clout. Uh, yeah. and so, so if you're saying on the e-commerce side it's, it's, and the technology side, it means that they're going to have a strong future in other dim dimensions, but we're going to have to live and see it, but let's continue. Yeah. Yeah. That could be, could be. Yeah. So Jordi, what are some important habits that you think successful entrepreneurs need to adopt? Well, now that I, that I have free time, I would say it's constant learning, mm -hmm. um, and not about not only about your uh, expertise like Amazon or Walmart or marketplaces, but I mean, I, I would love to um, learn Chinese, for example. Okay. I'm not ready now, but I'm learning how to trade stocks. So mm -hmm. something I would, yeah, I would recommend, you know, constant learning all the time. Learn about everything, learn about, you know, other guys on the environment on or out of your environment. Um, listen to podcasts, read books, I mean, and study. I mean, it's all about studying and learning new things. And then networking, networking on mostly on Twitter and LinkedIn, and then offline networking, like face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. You can attend, you know, like well, in Spain, the FEA show or the Prosper show in the US. I mean, if you can meet people face-to-face, -face, you'll, you'll have a great network. And then personal life and free time. I mean, for, at the end of the day, for me, it's all about my wife and my kids. So I, I love my work, but I work for them. So not for me. Right. So they come first. Awesome. That's the center of gravity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So Jordi, what are some tools that you're using right now that you feel have had a significant impact on your success? And it could be not just Amazon tools. It could be like Google Calendar, any kind of gadget. Yeah, alarm clock or whatever. Alarm clock. No, no, I hate the alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that would be Samsung alarm clock. Um, Google Tasks. It's a, a must for me and Google Calendar. And for the SEO clients, uh, Screaming Frog. Screaming Frog, it's uh, for web outlets and web scrubbing. That's a great tool. Ah. And hot jar, Amazon, you, you do hot jar at all? Uh, no. Not really. Uh, okay. That's mostly for um, conversion rate optimization and A-B testing. I was doing that years ago, but not anymore. But mm -hmm. I love culture. I love the heat maps. 
it's a great feature. Yeah, you're able to see right away where how they mm -hmm. people are interacting with the website and, and learn from that. Yeah. Yeah, that was so great. It felt like spying on your users. <laughs> But yeah. sometimes you watch the recordings, you know, like the navigation recordings, and it's like, hey, but why don't you click on this button? It's right I mean, there. It's right there. It's yeah. right there. Yeah. <laughs> and then when it comes to Amazon, of course, Jetida and Helium 10 and Jungle Scout. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of last questions. Firstly, what is one thing that you wish you knew before starting your personal Amazon journey? Mm, the ins and outs. Um, I didn't know back in the day that Amazon retail existed. So I thought I was competing against other sellers, not the beast himself. Mm -hmm. and, and then the numbers. Because when I started selling on Amazon, there was no Helium 10 or Jungle Scout. We didn't have an FEA calculator because there was no FEA in Spain. So it was really difficult to, to do the numbers. So I had to learn that by looking at my PNL at the end of the month, which was negative, of course. Mm. And yeah, the numbers are, you have to nail the numbers because otherwise you're, you're doomed. You said the book profit first, right? Profit first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And what is one thing, what is one piece of advice that you give entrepreneurs who are working with you in your consultancy now? So you had started selling back in 2015. It's changed dramatically from where we are now in 2024. Yeah. So what's your <laughs> piece of advice for sellers starting their journey today? Uh, niche targeting. I mean, if you like something or you are, or your expertise lies in a certain product or category, go for that niche. Um, and don't try to, you know, sell stuff that you don't understand. So to me, it's all about finding the right niche and the right product. But you have to understand um, what's the client, uh, what is the customer looking for? You can do that by looking at the reviews. But if you know the product, I mean, if you are using that product, it's much easier. I, I love that. We, I just had a conversation with Amanda Hanono with Seller Spy, and that was her advice as well, which was really know your product and how people are going to use it. Because at the end of the day, people don't buy products, they buy solutions. So what problem are you solving and how does your product fix it? So what are you solving for? They call it. Yeah, exactly. This Jordan, is a, a funny story. This, this guy was a, a student I had years ago and he started this drop shipping store selling dildos. Oh. And yeah. And people was asking him about the product and I was like, but have you ever used a dildo? And he was like, no, I don't know the first thing about it. I'm just drop shipping them because I, I read 50 shades of gray and I think this is going to sell out. And <laughs> well, he, the well, long story short, he was selling for six months. He sold one or two units maybe. Oh. And that was the end of the project of the project. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, when people is asking you about your product, you have to know the answers. So yeah. at least try it first. Yeah. yeah. Own and control your domain. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Last question for you. What is your prediction for the next 12 months in e-commerce? What do you think we're going to see? Hmm. The Chinese are coming. They're already here. They're already here. <laughs> they're already here. No, I was just joking. But of course, they are already here and they're leading the way in the e-commerce environment when it comes to technology and and marketplaces, because if you look at the numbers, I was just reading uh, Juosas, the guy at Marketplace Pulse. He he was saying that uh, Temu, AliExpress, um, Shein, and another Chinese player will hit 200 billion in revenue this year. Mm. That's insane. And most, yeah. most of that revenue is coming from the US. And these guys are Chinese actors. I mean, they, they are different culture, different, you know, believing different products, whatever, but they're selling 200 billion. That's crazy. Um, That's like, uh, yeah, almost a third of Amazon. Yeah. And in 12 months, I think, well, augmented reality shopping experiences um, will start popping out and then be more mainstream. And of course, sustainability and ethical practices. I think it, 
they will play a larger role um, in consumer choices and and branding, uh, with, especially in branding when you have a brand, yeah, differentiation, branding, yeah, yeah. continue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and then of course the Chinese marketplaces. I mean, I, I don't know if they're here to stay, but yeah, the, the other one was TikTok Shop, obviously. I don't know if they're here to stay, but they are driving a lot of um, a lot of revenue and traffic. So Temu on their own, I, I think they started 8,000 meta ad campaigns in just one week. That's insane. Wow. And I don't know about the US, but they are mo the most downloaded app um, on the Apple store in Spain. It's mm -hmm. all Temu, TikTok, and and the other one, Sheen. Yeah. So, yeah. They, they, they say that about the U.S. marketplace as well, that it's the most downloaded app. I wonder, though, how true those numbers are, only because I recently got a new phone. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you, like, get your new phone and you transfer everything and then it says, okay, we need to do an update. It was one of the apps that was automatically downloaded when I did the update. So I didn't trigger Ooh. that. So I'm wondering how true or how inflated those numbers are to make that be the case so because i so right now looking at my iphone uh-huh real snapshot tim was number one number two is threads interesting yeah. number three is google number four is TikTok. number five is chat gpt then whatsapp cap cup then cap cut is like a video editor then instagram yep. then mm -hmm. shane and then gmail that's the top 10 as we you know record this uh may of 2024 but when it comes to shopping apps it's all about Chinese apps. Top 10 are two, you know, Chinese shopping apps, which yeah. is Tamu and Shin, which is, tells you a lot. Definitely. And TikTok, because you have TikTok, TikTok. show. And that's true. So triple, it's, triple play. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Three <laughs> out of 10. And where's Walmart? No, I could. See, that, that's, this is where they, when they're penetrating because Walmart and Amazon, they're already in the app and, and the phones. But now yeah. these are catching, catching up and they're done. That, that's pretty much the process right now. Very hmm. good point. Yeah. The numbers are insane. They are. Jordi, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, everyone, if you're interested in learning more about Jordi and working with him, you can check out his website at jordiob.com or email him directly at jordiob at gmail.com. But thank you so much for this time. This has been such a lovely conversation. Thanks a lot for having me. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for everyone who tuned in today. If you liked what you saw, please be sure to give us a thumbs up, share your thoughts with us in the comments, subscribe to the show, and we will see you all on the next one.